Murray, who is being brought to you today by OCPAN, the Oklahoma Public Archaeology Network, and the Native American Studies Department here at OU. We are very jointly proud to bring this uh, speech to you. Dr. Montgomery is an associate professor at the University of Toronto, so she has come a long way to be here with us today. She has interests and expertise in all kinds of areas. Among them are indigenous archeologies, span community collaborative archeologies, settler colonialism, oral history, decolonization, feminisms, and critical cartography, to name a couple. She is currently involved in three distinct research projects. One is a tribally led research uh, program with Pecuris Pueblo in New Mexico. The next one is an investigation of the intersections of black and indigenous labor on mounds like our own Spyro. So one of the things that Dr. Montgomery is doing while she's here is getting a sense of the sorts of documents that we have from the WPA era investigations at Spyro Mound. And then the final of the three research endeavors is documentation of the digital divide among Canadian black and indigenous groups and development of some technological solutions there too. Tonight, Dr. Montgomery will discuss, as you can see on the screen here, radical sovereignty documenting indigenous autonomy across Indian country during the boarding school era. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Montgomery. Yay. We'll see how this mic works for me. That's a little too tall. <laughs> All right. Well, I've never had to compete with scones for attention. I will try my very best to, uh, to, to keep things interesting for you guys. So I'd just like to thank Bonnie for the invitation to talk with you all tonight about some of the uh, work that I started in 2016 when I was a postdoc at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I've kind of been working through uh, those materials over the past, uh, what is that, eight seven, six, six years or so uh, now. Can people hear me if I don't use the mic? Okay, all right, so I'll just not use the mic and I'll use my theater voice <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll avoid any feedback issues. So that's what I wanna talk to you guys about today is looking at some of the work and the, particularly the images that come from the Jesse H. Bradley collection and using that as a way to think through the different ways in which Native folks during the boarding school era, which I roughly say is 1870 to 1970 here in the United States, were actually activating their own forms of sovereignty by crafting spaces within reservations and within these colonial kind of assimilationist institutions like boarding and day school. So just to begin with a little bit of background, so in the US support for Indian education really begins in 1775 when the Continental Congress passed a bill appropriating $500, which was a lot of money in 1775 for the education of native youth at Dartmouth College. So after this time, education increasingly became a kind of cornerstone of American Indian policy. So much so that by 1820, there was 40 different schools in operation under the guidance of Christian missionaries and which were supported by government dollars. And they were educating students primarily on the Eastern seaboard. So this system of federal education really became kind of formalized in 1870. And by 1900, there was over 300 federally sponsored boarding and day schools in operation across the country, educating roughly 26,000 native youth each year. So the Indian education system was really perceived by liberally minded administrators as an ethical and efficient means of disappearing indigenous peoples through the reduction of Indians as Indians. In pursuing this mission, government officials really drew on this kind of assimilationist framework that imposed Euro-American cultural practices and values, things like Christianity, sedentism, agriculture, importantly for our talk today, the nuclear family household, as well as what's commonly referred to at the time as civilized dress onto Native families. As noted by Secretary of Indian Affairs, William Haleman in his annual report, the transformation of Native people into obedient citizens involves a kind of holistic program of both intellectual, but also bodily training. 
that involved instruction in English, arithmetic, good old Bible study, but also things like industrial training for boys and things like farming, metalworking, blacksmithing, as well as for girls, what was considered at the time the cultivation of domestic arts, things like sewing, ironing, and cooking. Much like the Indian education system, reservations were, were really considered at this time to be kind of temporary infrastructure that were part of controlling indigenous bodies. So these kind of reservations were seen as a culturative stepping stone, really temporary structures of boundary making, of surveillance and domination that would eventually become unnecessary once Native people were sufficiently incorporated into the dominant American society. So rather than focusing on this acculturative paradigm, which there's already been a great deal of scholarship about, what I want to talk about today is the traces of how Native families asserted their autonomy within this assimilationist paradigm. So over the past 10 years or so, there's been a growing number of archaeologists who have really contributed through the material record, but also through oral histories to our understanding of indigenous resistance, subversion, and persistence during the boarding school era. So building on this kind of growing body of work, I'd like to share some of the work that I've done with Chip at the Denver Mu Museum of Nature and Science around the Jesse Bradley collection. Jesse Bradley is pictured here with a couple of the collections that he acquired over the course of his role as an Indian school teacher on six different reservations across the American West. So Bradley and his wife, between 1893 and 1902, worked at a couple of different reservations, including the Port Gamble Day School, which is pictured here on your right, as well as the Lower Cut Meat Creek Day School in South Dakota. You can see here on your left, a picture of Bradley his wife, Della, and his son, Homer, in their cabin on the Rosebud Reservation. Bradley also worked at Cantonment here in Oklahoma on the Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation, as well as Supai and Palaka Day Schools in Arizona. So over the course of his fairly short career, right, only about seven years that he worked as an Indian school teacher, Bradley became a really avid amateur collector, uh, kind of, uh, amateur anthropologist, but also a photographer. And he purchased hundreds of ethnographic objects and took hundreds of photos, which really provide this super unique window into a, a pretty dynamic period in Native American history here in the United States. So for this evening, I'll really focus on collections and images from Bradley's time at the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, where he worked from 1895 until 1899 as well as his time on the Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation where he spent one year as a superintendent of the Cantonment Boarding School. That was the only boarding school that he worked at. All the other schools were day schools, which are basically kind of these uh, uh, nine to five public style schools like we have today. So I bring these, these kind of historic photographs, one of which you can see here, into a dialogue with archival records, but also with oral histories that Chip and I uh, conducted with tribal members on these reservations in 2016. So in talking about kind of daily life on the Rosebud and Cheyenne Arapaho reservations, I want to draw on some of the work of one of OU professor Laura Harjo's uh, kind of research interests in emergence geography. So in Spirals to the Stars, Harjo describes emergent geographies as these kind of everyday acts of placemaking, storytelling, and nation building through which indigenous communities come into being. Within this framework, Harjo lays out four distinct kind of spheres in which emergence geographies take place. There's these concrete permanent places, but there's also ephemeral gatherings. There's metaphysical spaces that link to spiritual realms. And then there's also virtual spheres that shape how information and communication between community members flows. So while all of these spheres are really important to the context of an emergence geography framework, what I really want to focus on for our conversation today is those concrete infrastructures, those elements of the built environment where Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho people engage in kind of homemaking, what I'll call homemaking practices, 
but also storytelling practices that structured how they kind of uh, came into being as part of the reservation landscape. So with all this kind of theoretical arguments in mind, here you can see Hardro's definition of concrete um, emergence geography. I wanna start by talking about how the Rosebud Reservation itself was formed and offer some preliminary evidence for how Lakota folks created emergence geographies within this colonial space. So the Rosebud Reservation emerged through a series of treaties, which slowly and incrementally consolidated sea lands. And this process really began in 1868 with the Fort Laramie Treaty, which forced Sioux peoples to relinquish most of their ancestral territories east of the Missouri River. A key provision in the Fort Laramie Treaty was that the federal government provide a schoolhouse and a teacher for every 30 students or children, uh, school aged children on the Great Sioux Reservation. So this kind of basic exchange of land for education was a fundamental part of most treaties that were made during this period and really tie together the reservation and the schoolhouse as an infrastructure of assimilation within federal Indian policy. Over the next two decades, federal administrators and settlers continued to really erode Sioux sovereignty through legal and illicit forms of land acquisition. In 1877, the Great Sioux Reservation was reduced from 60 million acres to 22 million acres. And in 1890, this territory was reduced again by another 9 million acres and divided into five smaller reservations, Standing Rock, Cheyenne River, Lower Brule, Pine Ridge, and Rosebud. The Rosebud Reservation was inhabited by a range of Lakota communities, which really created this kind of dynamic demographic tapestry, which was often difficult for federal administrators to identify or to quantify. In 1890, census records indicate that there was roughly 5,300 people living on Rosebud, and they identified seven distinct cultural affiliations, including two Brule groups, the Loafers, Wajaza, Two Kettle, and Northern Bands. Members of these distinct but interrelated communities often built home places together in aggregated settlements along creeks. During an oral history interview, in 2016 with Rosebud tribal member Leland Little Dog, he explained that despite cultural differences between these different groups, they all shared a common cosmogeography that really conceptualized streams and creeks throughout the reservation as the roots of a much larger tree that branched off from the Little White River. So each encampment along this Little White River and its branches was led by an influential male elder. For example, the followers of Spotted Tail chose to aggregate along the Whetstone Creek near the main Rosebud Agency, whereas uh, members of the Wajaja Band primarily congregated along the lower uh, Meat Creek. As Little Dog explained, in many instances where Lakota leaders chose to place their settlements was informed by underlying political tensions between families who either promoted the Fort Laramie Treaty or who had resisted it. While this division has been framed by colonial administrators in terms of progressive versus conservatives, this dualism I find really kind of obscures how indigenous leaders strategically responded to colonial mandates. So rather than being kind of exclusively shaped by these sort of assimilationist frameworks, my argument is that homemaking practices on Rosebud were largely grounded in the desires of community members to maintain kinship relations and associated cultural frameworks around leadership. So kin-based homemaking practices along waterways directly shaped the placement of day and boarding schools, which were constructed in areas where Lakota families had already established their settlements. So rather than the, the day schools becoming the nodes of, around which Lakota families circulated, it was actually the opposite way around. So for instance, oops, sorry, let's dismiss this. So one example of this is the St. Francis Mission Boarding School, which was constructed to serve 
Owl Feather wore Bonnet's camp of 40 different lodges. The Upper Hutt Leap Creek School was built to educate children living under the leadership of prominent headman Paulo Thornden. White River and Bull Creek schools were created to educate families associated with Medicine Bull's camp, the Oak Creek School with Good Voices camp, the Corn Creek School with Black Pipes camp, the Springs Creek School with Two Strikes camp, and the Ponca Creek School with Swift Bears camp. In some instances, these day schools were actually named explicitly after leaders whose encampments were organized around them. For instance, Pea Dog, Milk Camp, Little Crow, Red Leaf, Ring Thunder, as well as Whirlwind Soldier Day Camp. All of these schools named after prominent Lakota leaders really evoke the life histories of those leaders themselves, carrying those stories of the men and their communities into the present. So in addition to kind of memorializing specific band leaders, day schools were also named in reference to already established place names and place lore that existed prior to the formation of Rosebud as a reservation. For instance, Bull Creek Day School was established near an area referred to by community members as the Make the Buffalo Come Out Place, a place which is known today as Buffalo Butte. According to oral histories, Buffalo Buttes actually references this kind of epic oral history where community members went on a bison hunt where they were led by the bison through a series of caves in Buffalo Butte itself. Other day schools were named after important places which emerged after the formation of Rosebud. For instance, the upper and lower cut Meat Creek day schools were named after the annuity issue station which is depicted in this photograph taken by Bratley. So this annuity station was located about 10 miles from the Rosebud Agency. And in the Lakota language was called meat cut into strips. This was a reference to the fact that community members would receive their monthly beef ration from that annuity station. So situating these kind of federally sponsored schools within this broader cultural framework informed by Lakota placemaking practices, as well as land-based metaphors, I think helps to reframe Rosebud as an indigenous space rather than as this kind of colonial imposition. In addition to shaping where schools were constructed on the reservation, Lakota homemaking practices involving residential mobility in particular really structured daily life. Although colonial policies intended to encourage sedentism and cultivation really sought to limit mobility among tribal members. There's archival and oral historical evidence that Lakota people really continued to engage in fairly high levels of seasonal movement throughout the boarding school era. This is reflected in a statement here by Rosebud agent George Wright, who talks about how Lakota families moved between schools and allotments and really frames this as a kind of threat to colonial control which undermined their integration into American society. At the turn of the century, federal authorities really sought to curtail this type of residential mobility that Wright was talking about by authorizing the construction of more boarding schools. And the idea was that boarding schools like St. Mary's Mission, St. Francis's Mission, and the Rosebud Agency Mission schools would actually be able to kind of confine uh, indigenous people who were dispersed in these various settlements across the reservation into these kind of colonial institutions, right? Bringing them into this kind of carceral order uh, and really centralizing them under a kind of single surveillance mechanism where they could be more uh, consistently monitored and controlled. These government efforts to curtail mobility and impose a uh, kind of bodily order onto Lakota people were intensified with the initiation of allotment in 1884. So allotment on Rosebud radically altered previous settlement patterns by breaking up these extended kin-based bands into nuclear family units and placing them onto these 320-acre surveyed plots across the reservation. So while the allotment process was really intended to disrupt kinship networks, the archival record actually documents refusals of these kind of colonial mandates. 
According to Rosebud Agent Wright, in 1895, Lakota families were still using high tents as alternative or kind of secondary homes during the summer months to avoid heat and health hazards associated with living in these kind of confined cabins. Agent Chase McChesney corroborates Wright's account, reporting that Lakota families continued to assert their autonomy by moving between allotments and previously established encampments along creek banks. A decade later, the new supervisor in charge of the Rosebud Agency, Charles W. Davis, describes the persistent pattern of residential mobility in a letter to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. So in this letter, Agent Davis attributes the lack of attendance at the Bull Creek boarding school, or day school rather, to this kind of dual residence pattern that had emerged on the reservation where Lakota families would move between temporary camps at day school and more permanent cabins on allotments. So these series of records are written over the course of 15 years and really to me indicate that Rosebud residents were continue to, continuing to engage in these kind of seasonally grounded residential mobility patterns of summertime dispersal and then wintertime aggregation, despite these kind of government dictates around setting camp. The continuation of residential mobility is also documented in oral histories among community members. So during my conversation with Leland Little Dog, he talked about how his grandpa's generation all lived in tents and that they were still mobile and they still engaged in a lot of traditional hunting and gathering food practices. This continued cultural importance of mobility, as well as mobile domestic structures, like you see the tiki uh, depicted here at Rosebud, is archived in our, an arithmetic lesson that Bradley collected from one of his students, Charlie Black Cow, at the Tuckney Creek Day School. So you can see the assignment here. In this assignment, Black Cow uses various symbols to illustrate mathematical equations including the sign for a tiki. Charlie's math lesson offers this really subtle trace of Lakota domesticity within the colonial archive, which I think materially marks the persistence of this kind of mobile aesthetic under a colonial infrastructure. So what I hope is starting to emerge here is that Rosebud was this kind of co-created space, right? On the one hand, daily life was definitely influenced by colonial desires, to control native bodies and these Euro-American understandings of private property and civility. But they were also shaped by indigenous temporalities centered on seasonality, as well as homemaking practices that were really anchored in Lakota understandings of kinship, leadership, but also cultural geography. So this concept of homemaking provides a pretty useful framework, I think, for understanding this process of co-creation and autonomy. The term home place was first used by Bell Hooks to describe the, how the domestic sphere functioned as a site of political and social action for black families. In Hooks' work, she emphasizes how there's a mundane and relational nature around black agency within home places that draws particular attention to the role of everyday action in resisting these dominant ways of being and in ensuring individual and collective persistence. So there's obviously notable differences between black and indigenous constructions of home place, but I think the concept itself act actually offers a really productive lens for us to understand how indigenous people were using domestic spaces to actively construct new identities and social practices during the colonial, or during the ongoing colonial period, I guess we could say. So the significance of the home as this site of resistance and potential, but also potential reform was really recognized by colonial administrators of the day who developed all sorts of policies intended to control homemaking, including mandating that construction of log cabins. From a colonial optic, building log cabins wasn't just about replacing high tents, which were seen as backwards, right? The construction of these more permanent forms of Euro-American style housing was actually intended to keep the older generation at home and to, and to disrupt what Agent Wright has talked about as the, quote, constant disposition to roam. House construction was considered 
a key part of this kind of nonviolent way of physically bringing indigenous bodies into compliance with Western domestic norms. It was very much informed by Protestant notions of propriety, of cleanliness, and of gender roles. So within this framework, the classroom was actually a kind of critical space for instilling notions of domesticity and propriety. You can see this in the quote that I have here by Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Daniel M. Browning, where he talks about the Indian education system and more specifically day schools as being critical transformative sites in which the home life of indigenous people would be uh, radically altered by bringing them into contact with what he calls the quote, morality, cleanliness, and knowledge uh, of white man's civilization. So Lakota negotiations of these kind of colonial dictates around domestic practices are reflected in a couple of other assignments that Bradley collected from the Little Cut Meat Soup Schools, specifically written by Emma Elflipsback and Maggie Otterman. And this assignment was called My Home where the students had to describe in a kind of formulaic way the, the elements of their home life. So in this lesson dated from May 24th, 1899, a 17-year-old Emma describes her family's house, listing all the kind of material trappings of a typical Euro-American style cabin from this time period. She talks about the central stove, the red curtain, and the different forms of bedding. Age 14, Maggie's My Home essay describes a pretty similar pattern with details given to describing the house's kind of architectural features, um, like the windows and the chimney. In addition to really documenting the incorporation of these kind of Western style building techniques and furnishings into Lakota domestic practices, these essays actually reveal some shifting social relationships within the home place. For instance, Emma states that she lives in her father's home while her brother and grandmother live in separate houses. This might not seem like a significant finding here, but this reference actually points to a pretty major transformation in the residential practices of Lakota people who are moving from this extended kin-based settlement system into a nuclear household arrangement as a result of the process of allotment. So like Emma, Maggie describes the cabin she lives in as being her father's house, a designation which reflects the shifting logic of private property as linked to gender notions of male ownership and power within the domestic sphere. So unlike Emma, however, Maggie's narrative notes that her father actually owns three different cabins. So when we think about this in terms of established Lakota practices of residential mobility, what this kind of indicates is that ownership of multiple households can be interpreted as a sign of prestige and familial wealth. This would have mirrored pre-reservation practices in which multiple domestic structures would have been inhabited or essentially owned by the wives of a prestigious headman. So it's unclear, right, from uh, Maggie's short essay, who was actually living in each of these three different cabins, but it does suggest that these home places were not just beacons of Western civilization, as the colonial record would have us believe, but they were actually sites of cultural synthesis, where gender roles were both being maintained, but also transformed to fit into the new kind of reservation world. The co-created nature of gendered domestic practices is captured here in Emma's description of her mother, who she says did not wear white women's dress. So this is a real kind of assertion of a rejection of this kind of civilized dress. And it can be read as a kind of embodied act of refusal of Euro-American gendered fashion conventions and notions of propriety. The imposition of this Victorian aesthetic onto indigenous bodies is captured in a lot of photographs from this period that show Native children with cut hair wearing uh, government-issued uniforms. And the whole idea behind this, right, was that by changing the way that Indigenous people looked and dressed, by changing their physical appearance, you could also alter their mental disposition, right? Transforming both young and old into a kind of 
productive American citizen. So what's particularly significant then about Emma's description of her mom's rejection of Western style clothing is that it takes place in the home, right? It takes place in the domestic sphere rather than in this kind of public uh, uh, forum of resistance like at an agency building or in the schoolhouse. So I think this observation to me really reveals the important space of homes as safe sites of resistance and cultural expression. As theorized by Hooks, it was in the home away from the surveillance of dominant society that indigenous people could actually be empowered to shape and express their own identities as they saw them. Another expression of autonomy articulated within the home place is reflected in Emma's description of her father, which I've highlighted here, who she says owned plenty of horses. She also mentions that her brother owned plenty of cows and one saddle. So this description suggests that Emma's father and brother were among a growing number of Lakota men who had adopted Euro-American economic activities like trading and ranching as part of this kind of broader tra transition towards a wage labor economy on the reservation. We can see this kind of steady growth over time in ranching and trading economies uh, through this Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, report that documents the, the gradual increase in trading and hauling, particularly after 1890. So this increase in trading and ranching activity reflects the particular environment of the Rosebud Reservation in part, right? It's not, not everything is just a indigenous economy. Short, the Rosebud in particular had these short grass prairies with a unique combination of grandma, buffalo, and beef grasses, which really made it ideal for grazing cattle and horses. But beyond this kind of simple ecological affordance, there's also the widespread adoption of mobile wage economies is an assertion of Lakota sovereignty through cultural synthesis. So within this kind of evolving reservation economy, the gender nature of ranching and trading actually conform to already established understandings of the division of labor. Early 20th century ethnographies among the Lakota suggest that gardening and farming were actually largely perceived as women's work and were not seen as appropriate activities for men to engage in full time. In addition to these gendered considerations, freighting and cattle ranching were individualistic and self-directed enterprises. This is a kind of cadence of work which resembled pre-reservation economic systems that were really structured around individual mobility, unlike collective agriculture, right? And which could really respond to individual familial needs rather than external labor demands, right? You could take up trading when you needed money, and you could stop trading when you didn't need it, and you could go out and visit family, and you could tend to your garden, and you could do other things. It created flexibility in the way that other industries didn't. So in refusing kind of industrial agriculture, Lakota men, like Emma's father and brother, were able to enter the wage economy, but maintain culturally appropriated and gender practice. So these lessons that were penned by Charlie Blackcap and Emma Elklukback and Maggie Otterman offer a rare glimpse into the perspectives of indigenous youth during the boarding school era. While produced within the confines of colonial institutions, I think the content of these assignments really speak to the dynamic ways that Lakota families were asserting their autonomy through culturally informed ways of dressing, homemaking, but also industry. So rather than archiving acculturation, I think these assignments really support Grace Dillon's argument that Native peoples have always been and are always ready to adopt new technologies in ways that maintain core facets of their worldviews that are fundamentally rooted in the land. So in the brief time that I have uh, remaining here, I wanna just share some parallel evidence for these sorts of homemaking practices among the Cheyenne and Arapaho during the same period. So these assertions of autonomy take place around the cantonment boarding school, which is depicted here, and which was located on a grassy knoll overlooking the North Canadian River, about 70 miles from Darlington, Oklahoma. Like other boarding schools, cantonment was actually previously used as a military barracks 
connecting the school to a much larger colonial history of violence. Built in 1879, cantonment was intended to ease settler anxieties over Northern Cheyenne raiding in the neighboring states of the Kansas and Nebraska. Under the direction of Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Richard Dodge, four companies of the 23rd Infantry occupied this modest army post, which consisted of a really simple commissary, a hospital, and officer's barracks. These barracks were abandoned following the confinement of the Northern Cheyenne to the Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation in 1882. As on the Rosebud Reservation, colonial infrastructures like schools and agency buildings were really constructed in areas where indigenous families chose to camp. During the 1880s, Cheyenne and Arapaho families began to aggregate in these kind of temporary extended kin-based encampments along waterways within the reservation's boundaries. During the early 1880s in particular, 28 Arapaho families under the leadership of Little Raven, Heap of Bear, Yellow Bear, and Scabby Bull established encampments along the Canadian River near the cantonment outpost. The federal government responded to Arapaho settlement practices by sponsoring, uh, I'll go back here, by sponsoring the renovation of the barracks, which was reopened in 1898 as a federally operated boarding school for Cheyenne and Arapaho youth. Before 1898, it actually operated for several years uh, uh, as a Mennonite missionary school, um, which was also a kind of common transition for boarding schools to move from being church run to being acquired by the federal government. So when Jesse Bratley gets to cantonment for his one year as a superintendent, there was about 80 students enrolled. You can see in this picture of Bratley with, his, with the staff at the school here. And you can note that many of them are indigenous. And Bradley served as a superintendent for only one year. And during that one year, it's clear from his personal diary that he experienced a lot of resistance from the local community and that this resistance was often very violent. For example, in this account shown here, Bradley talks about how during Thanksgiving break, a grandmother tried to come in and take her grandson from the school and almost stabbed him in the process of doing it. During Bradley's year at Cantonment, he also documents several other altercations that he had with Native parents, including being pulled down the stairs and forcibly kicked out of the schoolhouse. So in addition to these kind of overt forms of resistance within these colonial spaces, Cheyenne Arapaho parents also exerted kind of influence within these colonial spaces themselves. For instance, in this image here, you see a group of Cheyenne men sitting outside of the cantonment boarding school. Now, according to tribal members, these men were actually designated by the community to monitor the school. And so they would regularly come to visit cantonment to ensure that the children in the school were actually being treated well. In addition to these kind of direct assertions of indigenous oversight within the colonial education system, Parents engage in these kind of more subtle forms of resistance through homemaking practices. So what you see in this picture here in the foreground is a series of teepees and brush structures that were owned by a Cheyenne family. And in the background is the cantonment boarding school. As at Rosebud, indigenous families on the Cheyenne Arapaho reservation continue to use mobile forms of house households uh, as their primary domestic space, which were really subverting, again, these government mandates to take up these kind of permanent sedentary forms of Euro-American style housing. The encampment practices captured in this image also archived the creation of alternative placemaking patterns involving this movement back and forth between allotments and temporary encampments located next to boarding schools. The practice of building home places next to cantonment continues to live on within the memory of tribal members. For example, Gordon Yellowman, a Cheyenne tribal member, talks, talked to us about how the, the elders would recount how some of our families would camp right there around the fort, um, but that they were not allowed to go and talk to their children. 
So although students were not permitted to communicate with their families directly, these home places were a conscious refusal to sever the ties between parents and children, which was trying to be enforced through these kind of carceral institutions like boarding schools. In many ways, I have to imagine that the mere presence of your parents in the vicinity would have provided a kind of familial support network that would have strengthened the well-being of Native youth within these confined spaces. So whether it was through these kind of violent uh, means of intervention, like the grandmother, or through forms of oversight or indirect surveillance, I think all of these examples really point to how Native parents worked within these asymmetrical power systems to ensure the well-being of their children. Cheyenne and Arapaho resistance to government dictates around domesticity in particular is reflected in an annual report by Agent George W.H. Stooch. So in 1900, Agent Stooch notes a significant discrepancy between previous reports that had said that most of the population on the reservation had actually taken up permanent log cabins at, on their allotments, and his observation that less than 20% were following government policies. He says it's something more like 12 to 18% of people had actually followed this policy. In this same report, Stooch goes on to discuss how Cheyenne and Arapaho tribal members subverted government initiatives to uh, encourage agriculture by actually throwing away or feeding the grains that they would receive for planting uh, to their horses, right, instead of farming. So the persistence of Cheyenne and Arapaho cultural frameworks and values during this boarding school period is further evidenced through some photographs of domestic play. So here, Bradley depicts an image, depicts some recreation at Cantonment with 13 play teepees arranged in this kind of U-shaped pattern. These sorts of toys were important teaching tools that conveyed proper conventions around the social placement of families within encampments, uh, but also important information about sacred geography. Okay. Ethno ethnographic work among the Northern and Southern Plains communities documents a connection between teepee poles and particular sacred directions, as well as understandings of power, important colors, and spiritual beings. So in this sense, practicing setting up and taking down teepees if only in these forms of play, would actually be a form of homemaking that would re-inscribe indigenous land-based worldviews and associated oral histories onto colonial landscapes like the boarding school. So the presence of culturally grounded toys like miniature teepees and dolls like this one depicted here from the Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation are particularly striking given the goal of federal education, which was complete eradication of any kind of indigenous expression of culture. Indeed, the underlying logic of the education system was that native children would become American through embodied interventions like haircutting, uniforms, and drilling. This logic, I think, is really captured here in a statement by Jesse Bratley from his personal journal, in which he argues for a direct relationship between haircutting and the advancement of the civilizing project. So this was obviously a kind of idealized mission that boarding schools like Cantonment were intended to undertake. And in reality, on the daily operational scale, it was not as straightforward or as consistent as federal policymakers would have imagined. Another example of this kind of interesting slippage during Bradley's time at Cantonment can be seen in this picture which you can see Homer, I don't know if this is a poem. Oh, this is Homer, and their son Homer, who's sitting, he's being educated in the same classroom as other Cheyenne, as Cheyenne and Arapaho students. So he's wearing the same government issued uniform, he's got the same haircut, and he's learning alongside these students. So this actually captures a clear violation of BIA policy, which prohibited white children from attending Indian schools. And this policy was informed by racist and eugenicist kind of fears around acculturation, right? These fears were actually one of the driving reasons that Bratley decided 
to actually retire from the Indian service in 1902. In an interview with a reporter for, after his retirement, Bradley talks about how his son Homer had started to become fluent in various indigenous languages from his time as a child on the Rosebud, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Havasupai, as well as Hopi reservations. So this is an image here uh, taken from the Rosebud reservation, or sorry, the Havasupai reservation, where Homer and his sister Hazel, this is Homer and his sister Hazel, are shown uh, riding a donkey down in the Grand Canyon. Bradley's fears over his children becoming quote unquote Indian, right, reflects these kind of notions of cultural contagion, which really lay at the heart of assimilationist framework. Ironically, his comments also suggest that this overwhelming civilizing force of education was actually not as complete or as powerful as policymakers trusted that it was. So in wrapping up for today, I think that the photographs and archival and oral historical evidence that I've talked about really offers some clear uh, evidence for how indigenous people engaged in place-based ba place forms of resistance. These acts of resistance represent what Harjo calls radical sovereignty, these kind of spatial expressions of indigenous ways of doing and being that ensured collective persistence and created emergent geographies on the Rosebud and Cheyenne Arapaho reservations. While these reservation boundaries and federally funded schools were colonial infrastructures intended to confine and control native bodies, in practice, they were co-created spaces, really structured by this dynamic interplay between indigenous homemaking practices and settler colonial policymaking. Within these emergent geographies, daily life was shaped by kinship relationships and culturally grounding notions of domesticity and cultural geography. And mobility was really at the center of a lot of these homemaking practices that undertaken by Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho families, which subverted government mandates against moving. As Cheyenne tribal member Chester Whiteman summarized in our conversations in 2016, it kind of went both ways. Some rebelled against it, some accepted it, and some just went back to being Indian, played their little game for a while, and then went back to being Indian. Thank you. I don't know how it usually works, but I'll take questions as long as they're not hard. And oh, I don't can everyone. This is the first comment. Is this is the loudest room I think I've ever been in, and either everyone's gassy or these are the loudest chairs that we have on campus as well. Um, the second one is also a comment. But did you guys record this, or is there a version of this online anywhere? Because I've got a couple of Cheyenne Arapaho friends that I was texting about this, and they're excited to to see it. Awesome. Okay. Um, the third one is the hard one. <laughs> um, but this actually goes back to the uh, slide and the kind of framing that you have with Bell Hooks mm -hmm. and her discussion of home. Yeah. Um, and in like my mind, I always link Bell's discussion of home with her discussion of the margins yeah. as well, right? Both places of empowerment, and I think because of their how they're interlinked. Um, and then always like for me, also like resonates with uh, stuff that Rena Swensel has written about with like the importance of home within. A community, uh, Rena Swenzel's Santa Clara, for other folks in the in the room, a philosopher from Santa Clara Pueblo and architectural historian, uh, where it's centered as a place of power within the community, right? Um, but I actually like taking those. I want to get your thoughts on the relationship to home as a place of empowerment within kind of anti-colonial, post-colonial frameworks, because I'm also thinking of like work that Chandra. Mohatney has written about home where she's discussed it explicitly as a place of radical imagination and empowerment and resistance to the to the state. And Chandra is an is, uh, East Indian sociologist who's written a lot on uh, resistance to British colonization and stuff. And, yeah. yeah. So I think 
One of the interesting things that I didn't mention in talking about hook is that this kind of concept of home print is really coming from a feminist standpoint, right? So it's it's not only for her about like black black kind of resistance or, or um, assertion or crafting of identity within the home print, but it's part of a radical feminist practice that's also about empowering women within the domestic sphere as a rejection of this foreign or hegemonic uh, patriarchal understanding of what the whole women are within the whole sphere. So I think that's why pairing it with um, Emma's description of a mother as not wearing a women's dress is so powerful because it, from a colonial object, it would be very easy to, to look at these kind of photographs of, of Native women learning these domestic arts, right, as, as evidence of a fundamental transformation and a different power of indigenous women in their society. But I think the context, when you think about the home place, not as a place of confinement into the Western domestic norm, but rather as a place of empowerment, actually opens up, I think, an imagination to, to reread some of these photographs So I, the way I kind of think about that home place as a, is as a framework for rereading colonial archives that may create that may create an expression of uh, you know subservience, particularly for women within these frameworks, and actually saying it, these spaces could they could be and they are not. Um, who? They can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, for those listening on Zoom, Yat e Farina King Yenishe, Bilagana Nishle, Dokia Ani Bashish Chin, Bilagana Dashache, Dosinijani Dashanale, Akote God Sagnishle. Um, I work with the uh, Native American boarding school studies. And so I'm curious in hearing more about your methods, because I mean, on my mind in the collaboration of indigenous truth telling of boarding schools that I'm working on here with partners at OU, OSU, NSU, and USU, these different um, institutions and their relationships with um, boarding school survivors or alumni, how they want to identify and um, respective communities, their descendants. I notice, you know, from your work, like objects of survivance um, and these images and what you're talking through, a lot, of, you know, you mentioned these archives are mostly in Denver where they're mm. based. Mm. Um, even Dr. Bork's uh, comment of, his Cheyenne and Arapaho contacts. Yeah. I wonder how, and you quote Gordon Yellowman, yeah. who's respected and works with um, specifically a lot with tribal historic preservation yeah. and Concho Indian boarding school. I'd like to hear more about um, our, how are you connecting this work with the respective communities, what their responses and thoughts are about these photos, um, what the um, interpretations are of uh, these materials, because um, it just resonated with me and dawned on me that um, in some work with students here at OU, there was a Cheyenne and a, a student from Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes who was learning a lot, talking to his own father, who didn't openly talk about his boarding school experiences, his experiences um, going through assimilation. So it's also, um, I wonder, I, I'm, I'm seeing that student's face in my mind in a way of what would he be thinking or, or sensing or his own father, who are generations later and have different experiences at, at boarding schools because there's particular generations and such. And I'm curious if that, if you could talk, if that has been something you've been approaching in your work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so in terms of where the, where are the quotes, uh, the oral histories that are being displayed coming from? 
So as part of this larger project that produced objects of survivance that I wrote with Chip, we used the Bradley collection as the anchor. And the goal of the project was to bring the collections to community members and to share all of Bradley's materials, including the photographs, the objects, um, as well as his personal journals. And he also wrote an unpublished um, biography about himself uh, and his work at some of these schools. And so all of that information was shared with community members and those formed the basis for these conversations that uh, took place in 2016 and 2017. And so community, in no way would I say this is comprehensive or in depth at any given community of any six communities that Bradley worked at. Uh, the the methodology as an archaeologist was to go to the tribal historic preservation officers uh, and to ask them to basically identify folks who would be interested in talking about the collections and learning about the uh, Bratley's work and um, talking about their experiences uh, and their family histories with uh, Indian education. So the conversations that we had were wide ranging in any given community. Um, in For the Cheyenne and Arapaho and, and on the Rosebud Reservation, we probably interviewed uh, six to 10 people on each, within each community, right? So definitely not in depth or highly representative. And we mainly talked to older folks. We didn't talk to younger folks uh, about their kind of historical memories of, of this period or how they, how they viewed the Indian education system. So in terms of kind of the broad brushstrokes, some community members, I'll speak specifically to um, the Cheyenne Arapaho conversations. Some community members um, talked about the violence of the system in terms particularly of their grandparents' experiences. Um, some talked about it as being actually a positive uh, impact overall for them personally. Um, some people, particularly on the Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation, talked about hauntings um, and the way in which cantonment was a haunted space uh, and had ghost stories of, about um, that school. Uh, and there was, a, there was a pretty wide range. Um, every, everybody that we talked to out of the small group that we were able to speak to did believe that archiving oral histories about boarding school and Indian education system more broadly was important, but not everybody knew what they wanted to get out of it or how to talk about it, I guess I would say. So also during those conversations, some people didn't really talk about schools at all. They talked instead about the objects, things like the dolls um, or other collection, other items that Bratley collected, um, and and more about the kind of period rather than about the education system. So I think honestly, really the next step moving from this work is to share it more broadly and to continue that kind of in-depth work with individual communities about these broader experiences. Because any kind of project only gets that just such a small, small element of it. Um, and because we were just thinking about this in terms of the collection, that's kind of what structured that, that, uh, that method and, and the results of it. I know we got to go, Lindsay. That was that was wonderful. Thank Thanks, you. Um, I just have a question about Bratley. Yeah. <laughs> what happened afterwards? Because he seemed I can see him as such the way you presented him as such an avatar <laughs> of the you know America at, at, you know at the turn of the century here, and he obviously wasn't. I mean, maybe in his own mind progressive, but we wouldn't <laughs> see him as progressive now with the last slides there. Certainly. What happened after he left? Because he seemed reasonably young with a very angry wife. All those photos. <laughs> and I'm just curious about that. This was um. This was I learned this in in um, looking at historic photographs. But this was actually a convention of the day: is that photographers would tell you not to smile because it would mess up the flash. And so that's why everybody looks so angry in all of these historic photographs. Um, 
So what happened to Bradley? So Bradley becomes a huge kind of amateur collector. And after he uh, finishes up his last stint at Hopi in 1902, he then goes back to Kansas where he was a homesteader and tries to restart his homestead as a working farm. And that doesn't last for too long. Eventually they move south to Miami where he then begins collecting stuff from the Seminole. Part of his collections has materials from there. And that's where he lives out the rest of his life. He becomes a postman and he works uh, as a mailman um, for a while. Uh, and then during that time, during his post-retirement years, he actually starts going around at local kind of community centers and giving talks about his time as an Indian school teacher and showing slides of all of the artifacts and the photographs that he collected. And so we have in the archives, some of his slide decks that he would give um, in these talks. And he's written up in things like the Miami Herald and stuff uh, from like 1915 as this like great uh, um, kind of knowledgeable source about the Indian people of, uh, of this um, era. And so he was, he really, I mean, he's kind of, I, I think he's very representative uh, of, a, of a lot of Indian school teachers at this time who also engaged in similar forms of collecting and documentation. And so one thing I didn't talk about today, but is just the confluence of kind of amateur anthropology and this, this period of, um, of education among uh, Native folks on reservations across the US. So yeah, he. <laughs> what happened to Bradley is he moved, he retired to Miami like many people <laughs> today tend to do. <laughs>